Good morning. Good morning. Glad to see everybody out this morning. I hope you've had a wonderful week. It's been a nice week. God gives us a nice week. Garden planting. It's all ready. Just let it grow. I planted the seeds. Jill planted the seeds. So God will make it grow. I hope you've had a wonderful week. We're going to give God all the honor, glory, and praise because He's worthy. He's the reason that we're here. So let's stand. Let's open up the word of prayer and let's give Him honor, glory, and praise. Father, I thank you so much for your Son. I thank you for all that He's done for us. Father, for the grace and the mercy that He's given us. Father, I thank you for allowing Him to do that. God, we just thank you so much for the blessings that you've given us this week. God, as we worship you today, open our hearts and minds. Uh, let us be ready to worship you in spirit and truth. Uh, let us shout to the Lord. Uh, let us sing songs of praise. And let us honor you today. We love you. It's in your son's name, Jesus Christ.
good to be in your house today. It's good to be here to study your word, to fellowship with one another, to be able to laugh and shake hands and see one another again and, and appreciate the great Savior we have in Christ. Father, we thank you this morning for the teachers that have taught, for those who have shared your word, for those who have gathered here to worship, to sing songs of praise to your Son, Jesus Christ. Please be with the minister now as he presents his message. Give his word strength. Give his word wisdom. Give his words the ability to touch a heart that might set the wheels in motion to bring them to Christ. Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for that sacrifice he made for us. And it's in his name we pray all these things. Amen. To piggyback off that, Sunday night church will well tonight will be at 4.30 instead of 5.30. So we're going to be starting in here at 4.30, continuing with the Chosen Episode 5. If you want to study the miracle of Jesus, uh, turning water into wine, that's what the episode is going to be tonight. So, with that said, the K-5 group can go with Jonah. The toddlers, the pre-kindergarten group can go with Miss Kayla Hamilton. As they are leaving, if you want to turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12, that would be great. Hebrews chapter 12. A few other announcements to make. Um, directory updates. That is going to be starting on the directory, I guess, this week. Um, if you have any changes made to your address, phone number, personal information, what have you, uh, there's a uh, sheet of information up there at the Welcome Center that you can correct that. Also, there is a uh, couples weekend. There's going to be a meeting right after the service today over here uh, to discuss location uh, for that. So any couples that are interested in doing that, please meet right up here after the service is over. There's also a couple of different kayaking dates uh, that they're asking you to sign up. Which date would be better for you if you want to go kayaking? You'll see the two dates on the sign-up sheet at the Welcome Center. We've also got a sign-up sheet out there for... The uh, church picnic, which is on Sunday, June the 13th, uh, barbecue, macaroni and cheese, coleslaw, beans, and dessert. Uh, it's going to be catered by the Nassies, who came here last year and did a fish fry down at the, at the um, shelter. But we're asking you to sign up so that we can know how much food we need to get for that. So please sign up by in, within the next two weeks, by May the 30th. You would sign up so that we can uh, let them know how much we need to get for that. Um, 
That's it. I think that is it. Oh, no, it's not it. Next Sunday is Graduate Sunday. we we'll be honoring high school graduates who are active here at Antioch. That's going to be at the very beginning of the service next week. Uh, we've got, I believe, a half dozen graduates that are going to be honoring, so please uh, keep that in mind as well. Some of you will remember on Easter Sunday while I was preaching, I told a story about how when I was a kid, my mom would always put together a really nice Easter basket uh, for my sisters and I. And it was a nice thing, but sort of the big thing with each Easter basket was a, a big Easter chocolate bunny, which sounds nice when you first say it until you realize that every year the Easter bunny that I got was hollow. Okay, and so it doesn't even count, right? If you get a hollow uh, chocolate Easter bunny, we'll be glad to know that since that sermon, I have received anonymously <laughs> two chocolate bunnies. Thank you, two chocolate bunnies, as you can see, made by both made by Russell Stover. Uh, one's a little bit bigger than the other, but both of these, you will be pleased to know, are solid chocolate Easter bunnies. Um, so thank you. So it's not uh, a hollow like my, my cheap mother's chocolate bunnies were. These were given, honestly, I know who gave me one of these. I have a pretty good suspicion on who gave me the other one. I have a very strong suspicion that they were both purchased at the Dollar, Dollar General Marketplace in Falmouth because they still have Easter candy there that's 70% off. So <laughs> this is nice, but you're cheap just like my mother. Let's just get that straight. So. I really appreciate the generosity there, but, you know, you're tight with us, so what can I say? But this morning we're continuing our series called Staying Power, and what we're doing is we're studying the first three verses of Hebrews chapter 12. In these verses, the Hebrew writer prepares the Christian life to running a race. And some of us who are running, we can be tempted to quit at times. There's going to be difficult times that come. There will be pressure that comes, and life is going to happen. And we're going to have thoughts about stopping the race. But the Hebrew writer challenges us in these three verses to develop staying power and to finish the race of faith well. And as we've done in the first two weeks of this series, I want us to do that again today, to read out loud together these three verses from Hebrews chapter 12. Please join me in reading this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. And so we're going through these three verses over a four-week period to understand how we can develop staying power as followers of Jesus. And so we talked about so far how in order to develop staying power, first of all, the Hebrew writer says we need to remember the Titans. Hebrews 12 comes right after Hebrews 11. And Hebrews 11 is kind of the faith chapter of the Bible. It's God's hall of faith, basically. And Hebrews 12 begins by challenging us to remember that we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, these titans of the faith, these heroes of the faith who develop staying power. And their lives speak to or they witness to us and they motivate us to finish the race of faith well. Then last week we talked about how the Hebrew writer challenges us to throw off everything that hinders and the sin that's so easily entangled. To lighten the load is what the Hebrew writer tells us. It's hard to run a race when you're carrying unnecessary excess weight. And so the Hebrew writer says, lighten your load, throw off everything that can weigh you down, whether it's things like stress and anxiety, or whether it's a, a sin situation that really slows us down as we try to run the race. Today we're going to focus on these next words in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. We're going to spend three weeks in verse 1, and then the last week will be in verse 2. But the rest of the verse 1 says, let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Now you look at these words. And at a cursory glance, these words in the Hebrew writer basically sound like a motivational speaker. Okay, just telling us to, to keep running and to not quit. And that's true on the surface, but there is a lot more to it when you break these, these individual words down to get into what he's saying. One thing that really stuck out to me as I was studying this recently is that this word race in the original Greek language is the word agon, 
A-G-O-N, the word agon. It's where we get the English word agony. Okay? So the word is found six times, that Greek word is found six times in the New Testament. It's translated race here. Two times it's translated fight. It's two other times it's translated conflict. And then in 1 Thessalonians 2, it's translated opposition. And so what the Hebrew writer is doing with this one word, agon, that's translated race here, is he's not just saying that it's a race. He's describing what type of race it is. It's an agonizing race race. It's a demanding race. It's not a jog on the beach. It's not a, not a casual run in the park on a 65 degree day. It's a challenging, demanding race, but it's also a fight. It is also a conflict, and that's how he describes the race of, uh, race of faith. It's a lot like what the young man in the video was doing. Is he's going up hill, and it's difficult for him. And so this is far from being easy, running this race of faith. The Hebrew writer acknowledges the reality of what his original audience was experiencing. And he says, look, it's a hard race. It's going to feel at times like it's the dead of winter and you're running into a headwind and the whole thing is on an incline. That's what it's going to feel like sometimes when you're running the race of faith, when you're trying to be a follower of Jesus. And also notice the Hebrew writer says the race that's marked out for us. I think sometimes... We see the race that's marked out for other people that looks a little bit easier, and we think to ourselves, well, if I had the race that was marked out for them, then I would be able to run a little bit better. And we tend to compare our race to other people's races that seem a lot easier than ours. And so in light of the agon, the race that we're running, the race or the fight or the conflict that's marked out for us, the Hebrew writer says, what you need to do is run with perseverance. In other words, just keep on running. You hear people sometimes who run lengthy distances. You ever hear of somebody that, that, that runs and they talk about hitting a wall? You ever heard somebody talk about hitting a wall when they're running a lengthy race? I think marathon runners are especially prone to this. They, they say they hit this wall, and it usually, I think, occurs at like two-thirds of the way into a race. It's the point where you just want to stop because your body feels like it's completely shutting down. Some of you will remember a story I shared on a Sunday night several years ago. Um, a friend of mine from Elizabethtown, uh, about seven or eight years ago in uh, late summer, he successfully completed an Ironman. Competition. How many of you are familiar with Ironman competitions? Okay, uh, I call them insane people competitions, basically. Here's what an Ironman competition looks like. Uh, the challenge starts at 7 o'clock in the morning, and it starts with a 2.4-mile swim. So you swim for 2.4 miles. Uh, that's like, you know, 1284 down here where you turn to go to sunrise. That's three miles. So you think about maybe going to the top of the hill where you start down to 1284. You're swimming from here to there. That's the way it starts, 7 o'clock in the morning. That has to be completed within 2 hours and 20 minutes. You don't just swim it and you're done. You've got to complete it in a certain amount of time. The second leg is a 112-mile bicycle ride. 112-mile bicycle ride. That has to be completed by 5.30 p.m. According to the Google machine, to go from here to the Young Center in Louisville, Kentucky is 107 miles. So imagine riding a bike from here to the Young Center in Louisville, and you're going to go an extra five miles because who wants to go to the Young Center in Louisville? That's where the Louisville car, that's where Satan's team plays college basketball. <laughs> and so imagine 107 miles, and then you go, you go five miles more. And then finally, the last leg is you've got a 26.2 mile run, which has to be completed by midnight. Now from here to Campbell County High School, according to Google, is 28 miles even. I think it's 27 miles to the little veterinary clinic there on 27 in Grand Slick. So think about running from here to, to that point, and that's what you're doing. So basically each contestant, had, each entrant has 17 hours to do this in order to be called an Ironman. Well, my friend completed a 2.4 mile swim in an hour, 19 minutes, and 6 seconds. It took him six hours, 44 minutes, and 30 seconds to do the 112-mile bike ride. And the 26-2-mile run was another six hours, 16 minutes, and 34 seconds. Total time for him doing this was 14 hours, 46 minutes, 
33 seconds. Now, they eat and they drink, obviously, while they are competing. But I ask him how long it takes his body to fully recover after completing an Ironman competition. He said at minimum it takes six months to fully recover. But he also said there's at least a minimum of six months training leading up to the event. He said for him, the scariest part was the swimming because you had all these people that go into the water at once and you just got bodies on top of each other. And he said, that's the scariest. He said the most grueling for him was the bike ride. And he said it's the hardest to train for, 112 miles. But then he said the most physically painful is the run. And that's partially because of everything you've done up until that point for eight hours or whatever it is. And now you've got to run 26.2 more miles. In your training, he said, you have to you have to train your body to not break down, which is which is a very difficult thing to do. And he said it takes a very long time to do that. He said the science behind it is amazing. During during the Ironman competition, he said you burn 13,000 calories all day and you're consuming anywhere from four to five thousand calories while you're competing but the part where he says you have to train your body not to break down that's what i thought of when i read these words from the hebrew writer where he says run the race with perseverance you can't break down you can't give up you you, you can't allow the spiritual wall that you're going to hit to knock you out of the race. You just have to keep persevering in this race that's marked out for you. In the words of that great theologian, Forrest Gump, you just have to keep on running. And it's just what you have to do. It's what he says, run with perseverance. And so the question then is, how do we do that? How do we keep on running when those times come where we feel like quitting? I think the first thing that we need to do is, is simple, but it's very important, is you have to understand there are going to be times when you feel like quitting. There will be times when you feel like quitting. Pain, pressure, discouragement, suffering, all of those things are inevitable for your life if you are a human being, especially if you are a follower of Jesus. Jesus said to his disciples in John 16, in this world you will have trouble. Not in this world you'll likely have trouble, or it's probable that you'll have trouble. In the world you will have trouble. It's certain, Jesus said, in this world you can expect trouble. You can expect difficult times that will make you want to quit running. The Apostle Peter wrote two letters to Christians. And these Christians were suffering and being persecuted for their faith. And we have these two letters in the New Testament today. And he talked to them about this. Because some of them had become disillusioned and confused with God because of all of these hardships that they were facing. Things hadn't turned out the way that they had expected they would, the way they hoped they would. And they were starting to blame God for this. And they thought, well, if, I, if, 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 I'm, on, if I'm on God's side, if I'm on Team Jesus, then shouldn't life be running a little bit more smoothly for me? But that's not, not how it was working out for these folks. And so Peter writes to them in his first letter to remind them of this. And he says to them in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, from the New Living Translation, he says, Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you're going through as if something strange were happening to you. Don't act like, because you're a follower of Jesus, that somehow you're exempt from problems. That you're exempt from difficulty and suffering. In the world, you're going to have trouble. Now, we have the promise of God's constant companionship. We have the promise of eternal life in heaven. But in the world, we're going to have trouble. Don't be surprised. In fact, expect trouble to come. Because if you're not expecting it, if you're not mentally prepared for difficulty, then when it eventually comes, it can devastate you. It can lead to you wanting to just, I, I want to quit the race. So if you understand that there's going to be times that you want to quit, you won't be as devastated when difficulty comes. And so maybe it's a health diagnosis that completely knocks your feet out from underneath you. Or maybe it's marriage challenges that somehow you thought you would be exempt from for some reason. Maybe it's unexpected expenses that come in. Or parenting isn't the smooth sailing that you thought that it would be. Prepare for those times and don't say, I never saw it coming. Jesus has promised you. These are going to come. There's going to come times when you feel like quitting. One of, my, one of the things that irritates me more than anything in this world 
is this theology that's out there. And I'm just, it is perpetrated predominantly by television evangelists. That if you follow Jesus, life's going to be good. And you're not going to have any problems, and it's just going to be winning for you the whole time. But then the bottom drops out of life. We feel like God is not holding up his end of the bargain. I mean, we've been taught that if we enter into this relationship with God, if we're a follower of Jesus, that his side of the deal is to keep things running smoothly. But then the storms come. Then the waves nearly drown us. And we feel like he let us down. Lord, you're not holding up your end of the bargain. Christian Smith is a sociologist. He says this is the reason why many people walk away from the church or faith altogether. He says they have this idea that it's God's job to keep us from going through difficulties and suffering. So when difficulties and suffering come our way, we think that God's not faithful and for some reason he's not trustworthy anymore. But Christian Smith says rightly, what we're believing here is not Christianity because Christianity does not teach that. Instead, he says, we're practicing a religion of what he calls moralistic therapeutic deism. Moralistic therapeutic deism. Here's how he's, he defines it. It's worshiping a God who blesses people who are good, nice, and fair, and he helps believers be happy and feel good about themselves. Now, maybe some of you are sitting here thinking, are you telling me we don't believe that? That's what I'm telling you. We don't believe that. Not only do we not believe that, not only is that unbiblical, that's satanic. To think that life is going to be smooth sailing because we follow Jesus. It's not what we believe. We don't believe that if you're a good little boy or a good little girl and you're well behaved and God's going to make life easy for you and you're not going to have any troubles or difficulties in life. And if that's what, that's what you buy into though, and then difficulty comes... You can feel like quitting. Smith says that the people who have this naive view of God, he said when reality hits, you shouldn't be surprised when these people just walk away from the church or walk away from faith altogether. The Bible teaches, Jesus said, in the world you will have trouble. You will have hardship or will be suffering. We talked about this on a Sunday night a couple of weeks back. But you take a look at the cream of the crop from Scripture. You take a look at some of the greatest heroes of the faith, the best of the best in Scripture, and you see this truth lived out in their lives. The Apostle Paul wrote more words of Scripture than any other human being there is. Here's how he described his life. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I have, he says, been put in jail more often, been whipped times without number, and faced death again and again. Five different times the Jews gave me 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. He's not talking about drug use there. He's talking about being stoned to death. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and day adrift at sea. I traveled many weary miles. Faced danger from flooded rivers and from robbers. I faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. I faced dangers in cities and the deserts and on the stormy seas. I faced danger from men who claim to be Christians, but they aren't. I've lived with weariness and pain and sleepless nights, and often I've been hungry and thirsty and have gone without food. Often I've shivered with cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. That's not exactly what I would call your best life now. And what Paul does not say here, for obvious reasons, is that he was also beheaded. That's how he left this world, beheaded for his faith. That was also the fate of another guy in the New Testament. A guy that Jesus said was the greatest man born of woman, John the Baptist. John had one job, preach a message of baptism and prepare, or baptism and repentance, and prepare the people of that day for the arrival of Jesus, for the arrival of the Messiah. John performed that task as well as it could be performed. He did exactly what he was supposed to do. And his reward was imprisonment. Beheading simply at the behest of a, of a vengeful life of a king. Job, in the Old Testament, is called by God the greatest man living in his era. 
His reward for that was losing his vast wealth and during a horrifying skin disease. And also, he buried all ten of his children, seven sons and three daughters, simultaneously. Greatest man living in his generation. Peter, who preached the first gospel sermon that resulted in 3,000 people giving their lives to Jesus in one day, according to secular history, crucified upside down. The rest of the apostles, with the exception of John, all died horrifying martyrs' deaths. Some of them were crucified, one of them was speared to death, one of them was burned to death, one was stoned and clubbed to death, one was stabbed to death, one was skinned to death, one was beheaded. Health and wealth theology is junk. It's garbage. In the world, you're going to have trouble. It's sound theology. That's what the actual Jesus taught us. Understanding Understanding that basic truth, that there will be times when you want to quit, is one way that we can run with perseverance this race that has been marked out for us. Now, if I haven't lost you yet, I'm going to lose you here. Here's the second way we can run with perseverance. Be glad. Be glad. For the times when you want to quit running. What? Are you trying to get fired? Well, you know, maybe I don't know. What are you talking about? Be glad? Are you, are you out of your mind? Peter tells us, 1 Peter 4, 12, don't be surprised at these trials that you're going through. Then he says this in the very next verse. Instead, be very for these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering, so that you will have a wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it's revealed to all the world. Peter says, look, since Jesus suffered, you're going to suffer too because you're his followers. If the Son of God, of all those people I just mentioned, if Jesus was not exempt from pain and suffering, why do you think you're going to be sheltered from it? Instead, Peter says, I want you to be glad when it comes. When those trials come, because that makes you a partner with Jesus. These desperate moments, some of you know this, they connect you with the Lord in a way that you otherwise would not have been connected with Him. That's what they do. They lead you to a dependence on Him that you, you would never have known and cultivated without Him. Some of you might be familiar with the name John Erickson Tata. She is a quadriplegic, completely unable to use her arms and legs for most of her life because of a diving accident that took place when she was 18 years old. And she endured, after that, lengthy bouts of depression, anger at God. She even said she was suicidal on a number of occasions. But she has learned to persevere over time. She learned to paint just by using her teeth. She learned to write by using her teeth. And today she is a highly sought after Christian speaker and author. And this is what she wrote about the pain and disability that she's lived with for her entire adult life. She said this, if I could, I would take this wheelchair to heaven with me. And standing next to my Savior Jesus Christ, I would say, Lord, do you see this wheelchair? Well, before you throw it into hell, I want to tell you something about it. You were right. When you said in this world you will have trouble, there's a lot of trouble being a quadriplegic, but you know what? The weaker I was in that thing, the harder I leaned on you. And the harder I leaned on you, the stronger I discovered you to be. Thank you for that bruising blessing. It was a severe mercy. Thank you for that bruising blessing, for that severe mercy. <coughs> And for her greatest trial in life, this accident that led to her being tempted to take her own life, she says that is what eventually helped her to lean the hardest on the Lord. And her faith today is stronger at the age of 71 because of, because of the pain she's gone through. She would not be who she is today in Christ without that, <coughs> without that bruising blessing, as she calls. One of the greatest examples of this is one of the lesser known examples of this from Scripture. It's from an Old Testament prophet named Habakkuk. 
Now, I know a lot of you probably have the book of Habakkuk memorized, uh, but in Habakkuk chapter 3, he describes all the different disappointments and devastation that is going on around him. And this is what Habakkuk says in Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. He says, even though the fig trees have no blossoms and there are no grapes on the vines, even though the olive crop fails and the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. Now, this is an agricultural society that he is living in. And he is describing one agricultural disappointment after another. And there's all this despair. But in the midst of it, this prophet of God, Habakkuk, says, Nevertheless, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God's salvation. And maybe if you were to paraphrase Habakkuk's words today, you might say, Though I am unemployed, though my spouse has cancer, Though my heart has been broken, though my child is sick and dying, though everything in my life seems like a mess, though my future is uncertain and I am very scared, nevertheless, I will, I will rejoice in the Lord. Because friends, let me tell you, we worship the rock of ages. And because of that, we can have this illogical, unreasonable, defiant spirit that says, I'm going to worship him anyway. Job says, though he slay me, I will trust him. I'm going to be joyful in him regardless. Last way we run up perseverance is a lot easier for us to grasp, and that is to understand that pain will not last forever. Pain will not last forever. There is a day coming when the heartache and the discouragement and the adversity will be no more. Revelation 21 describes this day when eternity in heaven begins for the follower of Jesus. And Revelation 20 said, 21 says there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. It will all be gone permanently in the rearview mirror. Now for some of you here today, you have had some rough patches in life. For others of you here today, you've had hurricane-like tragedies that you've endured. I would tell you, regardless of who you are and what you've gone through, those things are just for a moment. The Bible says weeping may remain for the night, but what comes in the morning? Joy. Joy comes in the morning. Just know that these things are for a moment. And before you know it, you and I are going to arrive in a city where the streets are paved with gold. And heartache is forever a thing of the past. And there's nothing but peace and joy and fulfillment and satisfaction and reunions for all of eternity. So keep running. Keep running this race with running this race with perseverance that's been marked out for. Kayla Montgomery, the young lady, was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis when she was 15. Some of you know that MS is an autoimmune disorder that affects the nerves that primarily target the brain and the spine. Now that is a problem for anybody who has that. But it was especially problematic for Kayla Montgomery because she always wanted to be a competitive runner. Heat sensitivity is evidently one of the numerous symptoms of MS, and so if, what happens if a runner overheats? then their symptoms flare up and it would result in a loss of feeling completely from the waist down. But still, Kayla Montgomery, Montgomery wanted to run in spite of her uh, MS. And so that's what she did. She, she did and she does run. Stand out on her high school track team in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. She set distance records, won state titles, competed in national competitions. She eventually earned an athletic scholarship at Lipscomb University in Nashville, Tennessee. At one time, she was one of the top 25 runners in the United States. Here's the thing, though. Kayla Montgomery ran her races predominantly not feeling her legs whatsoever. 
because of the multiple sclerosis. Numbness would often set in after the first mile marker, and then she had to totally rely on her momentum to just keep going. What it was like, the way she describes it, is like she's running on cruise control, or she's running on autopilot. Now that enabled her to run, but what it did not enable her to do was stop when the race was over. She would always cross the finish line and she had absolutely no ability to decelerate. She had no ability whatsoever to stop running. And so here's what she would do. In order to stop, she had to, to depend exclusively on one person, and that was her coach. He was a fixture at all of her races, always shouting and encouraging and pushing Kayla. But his greatest contribution to her running career was catching her when she crossed the finish line. He would literally stand at the finish line awaiting her, and she would cross the finish line and, and just crash into his arms. She didn't slow down because she couldn't slow down. And so they literally, at the end of every race she competed, and they collided at the finish line, and he would do the best that he could do to catch her. And when he was finally able to, able to fault her forward progress, he would lift up her five foot one inch frame into a heap, carry her off the track, and he would then carry her to a safe spot give her some water and ice, and gradually her body's temperature would lower and the feeling in her waist and legs would return. Now, the correlation to the Christian is obvious. There is coming a day that if we keep on running, we will cross that finish line and we will run into the welcoming embrace of our coach, God the Father. And all the pain we endured, all the heartache we experienced, all the times when we felt like quitting will be behind us forever. And we will hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for these words today that challenge us to just very simply keep on running. You've told us in your word, Father, that there's going to be heartache. There's going to be difficulties. They will be numerous. But you told us here through the Hebrew writer to keep running this race with perseverance that's been marked out for us. It is agonizing. It is demanding. It is incredibly difficult. But, Father, help us to be inspired by these heroes of the past who kept running. And Father, help us to be encouraged by people around us today that we see who, who keep on running. And help us, Father, today to commit to keep on running when we feel like we We pray that you would do that via your Holy Spirit, through the encouragement of other people, through the conviction of your word, through the hope of crossing that finish line and crashing into your open arms. And Father, that hope is only available because of your Son, and because of what he did for us on a cross and in an empty tomb. And if there's somebody here today that has never received Jesus as the Lord and Savior of their life, I pray that during this time of invitation they would accept him as such. We thank you so much for all that you do, and more than anything, we thank you for Jesus and for his grace. And in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand today and sing our song of invitation. <laughs> Yeah.
before we sing the final song, there are a few announcements that I forgot to make. First of all, um, Clyde George and Bonnie Cavanaugh are both at River Valley Nursing Home in Butler. They are right across the hall from each other. Uh, and so they would both like to get visits, cards, that kind of thing. Clyde's birthday was yesterday, is that correct? Uh, he may be coming home uh, this week sometime. Okay. Clyde may be coming home, so hopefully that will happen. Uh, but uh, I know that they would love to receive visits or phone calls or cards. I know some, some people have sent some cards, so that would be very much appreciated if you could do that. But go to River Valley and Butler. Also, we do birthdays when they fall on Sunday. And today, I forgot, Mr. Dearest Joshua Cruz has a birthday today. So let's sing happy birthday to Josh Cruz before we sing our final song. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Josh. Happy birthday to you. Red face, that's what we love.